So Holy Spirit, we want to invite you to come into this very room. And God, really lead us today. Speak to the parts of us, God, that don't want to hear. Change those areas, God. We give you permission. We thank you. And we bind the enemy and all the distractions, all the things weighing us down. We want to pray that the Spirit of God would come and bring liberty today. In Jesus' name, amen. How many people saw this movie? What is this movie? The, the 40 year old virgin. Yeah. And this, is, uh, this is not something I created with Photoshop or anything like that, okay? This is uh, something actually uh, that they made up, okay? A couple of years ago, the longer you wait, the hotter it gets. And you go, what are we talking about this out of all days? Well, because our generation. Currently, and especially that we live in New York City, I mean, sexuality is something that the church has repressed for so long. It's not like you people don't struggle with it. It's not that it doesn't come up in your mind. And some guys are like, mm, yes. And, um, you know, and, uh, and it's refreshing. I think it's refreshing to bring it to the open because the truth is, movies like this, and even though if you really saw it, it's actually a good story. You know, he waited to 40 years and he found his true love. Okay? And then, of course, New York City would say, yeah, right. That's retarded. You are a prude if you're a virgin 40. And New York City, we have this, you know, objectifying, cynical, you know, put, put down on, you know, being prudes or, or being repressed sexually. Because, come on, we're not, we're no longer in the first century. It's 2008. Come on, get a little more progressive, will you? It's time to, you know, get loose, get free. That's our message in our city. And just because you're a Christian, some of you in the process, and if you're not, don't worry, we'll get you there. Um, it doesn't mean that you can escape this spirit that is infiltrated our culture. You know? And I want to talk openly about it. Ask anything right now. I'm just kidding. No. Don't do that. <laughs> Someone's going to ask some stupid question. But, yeah, it's, it's about an honest discussion about the last message of breaking the zero barrier. Because this issue is put under the rug for way too long. But really, the spirit of lust, or I don't, I don't like to, you know, talk about sexuality like it's a disease because sex is a good thing, you know? God created it, and I want you to have a lot of it when it's okay for you to have it. Okay? I, I want, and you go... <laughs> Are we mature enough to do NC-17 today? Oh, come, come on. No. You, you know what I'm saying? Like, I want you to be open to it because God created you this way. It's not a mistake. You're like, okay, that's, that's good. Okay, good. You're with me. But how do you maintain not sexual purity? Because I think it sometimes gets confused with the idea of shame with sexuality. Anything, anybody mentions sex in the Republican Party, everybody's, you know, shutting the doors, closing everything. You know, I mean, sex scandals. And now, I mean, it's getting so bad in the church, not just in the world, in the church, that when some pastor falls, we just hope it's heterosexual and not homosexual. We're just like, oh, just tell me that it was some woman. Don't tell me it was a man. Please. Because if it was a woman, I would understand. So there, there is a, um, what, what we call a, you know, the standard of holiness in, in this area of sexual integrity has gone down the drain because our culture is so liberated from it, the sexual revolution, that it's overtaken everything. And it affects you, the millennial generation. It does, and it will. And one of the basic reasons why is because no one talks about it. But I will. <laughs> I am 100%. 
not abashed by it. <laughs> I will make you feel abashed by it. Because we're going to start after this series, okay? And, and I know this is going a little long in introduction today, but I want to make it a springboard. Um, to, next Sunday, we're going to worship in the big sanctuary. It fits 660 people, okay? Obviously, we're not going to fit all of it. <laughs> <laughs> but as we continue to grow, one of the things that we're going to do up there is pray for, we're going to talk about vision, and then we're going to go into a series of sex, marriage, and dating. Okay? <laughs> That's right. Get ready for that, because you're going to feel very bashful, and I want you to. Okay? We're going to go into that, because everybody, everybody wants to know these things, but no one talks about them, and I want to, because it's fun to. <laughs> but seriously, the question I want to ask today is, how, how do you really... Keep yourself pure in this adulterated generation. Is it even possible? Because you know what? A lot of believers and a lot of, I have tons of brothers and sisters. I hate the, the, Christian, the, the, the West Wing Christian that makes men just horny people or just men, people that are filled with sexuality. Please! That's bull crap. Women have sexual desire too. <laughs> that's, that's right. I'm honest. It, it, yeah, women have sexual desire too. And last time I checked in Egypt, Joseph was the one running away from the woman, not the other way around. But the truth is, a lot of people are asking this question. Living in 2008, is it really possible for me to live a life of sexual integrity? Because I'm gonna, I'm gonna define sexual purity and sexual integrity, but I think those two things get confused. Because let me tell you, when God looks down from heaven, he has no problem with sexual activity. He doesn't go, oh my gosh, I can't believe you're doing that. There's not, he created the idea. <laughs> Okay, when he, he created the very idea of it, and every, you, you think the French made French, they made the, you know, what, what do we call it? What? Okay, sing. The tongue. You think they, no. God thought of that first. Okay? Read Song, Song of Solomon. It's ridiculous. It's like X-rated. Only for married people only. That's one book you should skip if you're single. Even dating, it'll encourage too much bad stuff. <laughs> now, now, if we're gonna talk about this, is it possible for you to keep pure in this generation? I think the answer is yes, if you know the facts. If you know the truth about it. And that's the question Jesus can answer. You know, how does a young man in this generation keep himself or herself pure? Both genders. Okay, brothers and brothers, I'm not just talking to you today. I'm talking to everybody. All the brothers say amen. amen. People pick on you guys. You guys are messed up too, but you know, everybody needs to deal with this issue. Okay, let's go. Matthew 5. I gave up my Mac and now I'm using my Kindle, okay? <laughs> Matthew 5, verse 27 to verse 31. Now, there's something that you have to understand about Matthew 5, okay? It's infamous, right? And it, it takes a lot of Pharisees off because Jesus is preaching at where? At the Sermon of the Mount. Now, remember, at Matthew chapter 4 and, and before those things, Jesus does a lot of miracles. People are fascinated by Jesus. And they want healing. They, you know, they want more free food. Remember when Jesus did that 5,000-member barbecue and he fed everybody? You know, so it was very entertaining and very powerful. But now Jesus was beginning to climb a mountain. And a lot of people, a lot of people at this point dispersed because Jesus was no longer doing miracles. All the superficial stuff was done. He was talking about how do you really follow after God in their generation. And only the committed began to climb the mountain with him. You get the picture? So this message is not for people that are timid or weak. The, this message is for people that really want to follow after God. How many people really want to follow after God? Amen. It's for you then. Jesus is talking to you directly from this passage. And, and we, I want to start from here. Why does they go to sleep? Come back. Come, come away. All right, there you go. 
Okay. Verse 27. You have heard that it was said, do not commit adultery. And everybody's like, I'm not married. I'm not committing adultery. Just wait. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Now stop right there. Now of course, one of the main questions when you read this passage and you hear about do not commit adultery, what, what, is, what tense is that? Imperative. I know some people want to call it, right? Imperative. It's a command. Do not commit adultery. Where does this commandment come from? It's the seventh commandment. Do not commit adultery. Right? Do not commit it. It's, it's, it's an imperative. Do not do this. And then a lot of people in our generation will go, well, I'm not married. How am I going to commit adultery? Well, this is, this is certain things that we need to discuss today in ancient times. In, middle to, in, in ancient times, in Mesopotamia, this is how they did it, okay? First of all, there is no concept of premarital sex in Mesopotamia or the Middle East. So when we talk about premarital sex, we need to put that, push that aside, and we need to talk about the cultural context of Matthew. Because in the Middle East, if you had sex before you're married, you're ruined. It's honor and shame culture. No one dared to have sex except the pagans. If you were Jewish, in any part of this tradition, you knew. I mean, uh, everyone here, you know, you ever heard of arranged marriages? Anybody want to do that? Mm -hmm. These people in this context, Matthew chapter 5, they like to arrange marriages. Guaranteed sex. Guaranteed pure sex. Like really? Yeah. That's how they did it for the last 2,000 years as a people. Arranged marriages. And remember, we talked about Matthew 25, right? How many cows I have to give to to get that. Seriously. So, there is no ideal for marital sex because the culture itself is pledged marriages. The parents go and find the mate for each other. And, you know, girls, and boys, they didn't really have to worry about it. I mean, by the time they were 13, they're going to be married. So, talking about passionate desire. And then you go, and one, one of the things people ask me is, come on, girls don't have that. Don't have desire. I said, are you stupid? Didn't you read the diary of Anne Frank? <laughs> and you're like, oh, you, you, all the people that go, what? You're stupid. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> diary of Anne Frank talks about Anne Frank. She is 13, 14 years old, writing about the occupation of Nazi and Hitler. And she's talking about sexual exploration. And you know what? Sexual exploration is not sinful. We're going to talk about masturbation later. But... We're going to talk about sexual Let me tell you, I want, to, I want to be honest with you here. You, you're like, oh, all bashful. Please. They have, come on, you, you go home, you have cable, you can, look, you can buy Playboy. You can go online, there's tons, 90% of the internet is all, all porn. We can talk about this. I mean, one of the weird things for Lydia was, one of the weird things for Lydia was when, when Nathan, you know, he, he, you know, he's a boy. And when you change his diaper, sometimes he touches his penis. <laughs> and people are like, that's gross. No. I mean, it's good that my son knows that he has that thing there. It's sexual exploration. <coughs> you get that? Now, because the culture back then did not have time for that, if you want to bring this into context of our generation, because all of you, no matter how ugly, no, how beautiful you are, and how good looking, you have to find your own mate. You have to find that channel to put that sexual desire to work. Because God said in Genesis, be fruitful and multiply. Have lots of sex. Pure sex. Godly sex. Now, so there, there's a problem here, right? The problem is you're not married, but you have sexual desire. Then how do I keep myself pure? I mean, I'm, I'm, I have eyes. I have a mind. No, that's a bad thing to have. How do I, how do, I do it then? Well, a lot of people take this, even in a lot of Christian schools, and say, 
well, wrong is if I don't have sex. And what's the definition of sex in the Webster Dictionary? Intercourse. I'm holy. And then Jesus says, no. <laughs> because that's what we call superficial integrity, right? An exterior of looking holy, but inwardly you are sinful. The darkness, the dark side. You know what I'm talking about. And that's why Jesus says there, right, right here after that, he says, you have, you have what? Heard. I gotta say that again. You have, heard. you have heard. You thought, you presupposed, you assumed that I judge just the tenth, the seventh commandment. And then Jesus says in verse 28, do not commit adultery. We can, it can be identical to our context, do not have sex before marriage, right? But I tell you that anyone who looks at a or man, Thank you. <laughs> who looks at a woman, or man lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his. Now he's talking about the seventh commandment, and then Jesus ironically brings the tenth commandment. What's the tenth commandment? Do not covet. Now he takes it a little bit further of the matter of the heart. One time, a young man came to me and said, <coughs> Pastor Sam, this is a little embarrassing for me, but I, I, I want to know, okay, I just really, God, you're a godly man, I, I want to know, how far can I go without going to hell? I said, you're already going to hell. <laughs> you're already going. And he goes, why? I thought God said don't have sex. Well, the Bible never says, ever, don't have sex. Why would God say that? He invented it. It's context, isn't it? Why would God say don't have sex? Well, you think God has something against sex? God doesn't have anything against sex. He has something against the lack of integrity of people. You were like, oh, yeah, bro. I don't want to talk about this. You're going to talk about it. It's about the heart. What he's saying is, how much can I get away with not, and not get in trouble? Okay, well, you see, here's the problem for me. Okay, when you kiss someone, you're going to want to have sex. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> All right, It's a one-time deal. That's how God invented the body. Sexual desire is aroused by physical contact. Yeah, we, we just want to kiss. What do you think is going to happen next? You think you're going to hold hands next? <laughs> you think you're going to hold hands and go watch a movie next? Trust me, you're not going to be interested in a movie. After, you know, after that's going on. So when you ask this question, how far can I go? It's a stupid question to ask. That's stupid sexuality. It's permission to take advantage of holiness. And many of you here, and many of your friends, many people in our generation, believers in general, struggle with this. And what I'm telling you right now is whether you're dating or not dating, you have to remove, you have to remove the heart motives, those sexual heart motives away from your heart because you cannot continue to do it and think you're still holy. You can't. That's what Jesus is talking about here. He's already committed adultery with her in his heart. Uh, another, another um, and, you know, this is a funny one. Uh, another friend of mine, a long time ago in ministry, like five years ago, he was a pastor. And you know, when pastors get together, it's not that holy either, you know what I mean? They, they act righteous. I'm the only real righteous. No, I'm just kidding. You know, I mean, they talk about, he goes, okay, Sam, and he was saying, I'm like, no, man, you can't look more than even three seconds. He's like, what if I look just five, sec five minutes? 
<laughs> he goes, I won't, I won't look again. Because he said, because we were talking about you can't do a double look, because that's lust. Billy Graham talked about that. Billy Graham said that even he looks once, but if you look twice, that's lust. Because, I mean, human beings are not that innocent, okay? You can look, you can look, but it doesn't mean the second look is not going to be innocent. Why are you laughing? And, and Billy Graham said that. And, you know, he, he said, can I look five minutes? No, you can't look. You, what do you think you're going to be thinking in that five minutes? And he said, right. And I just smacked him once. <laughs> But here, here's the big difference, okay? Here's the big difference. You need, to get, you need to get this. God is not against attraction, right? Everybody do this. Ooh, thank you, Jesus, right? Because attraction is something, attraction in, in, in the Old Testament wouldn't really matter, right? Or the New Testament wouldn't matter because there's a rich marriage. You got what you got. And you have to find a way to love each other. <laughs> You got what you got. Now you get to choose what you get. And which is why it's more dangerous. Because it's someone you actually do like. You actually even do love. You actually want to be invested in. I mean, then what do you do? So the text is not against attraction. I'm glad you have attraction to the opposite sex, OK? I praise Jesus. I'm, I'm deadly afraid, I'm, and I'm not homophobic at all, okay? It's just that it's a headache to deal with that issue, you know? And I, I, you know what? If there's that issue, I will deal with it. Amen. I will deal with it. Anyone that have that problem, I want you to go directly to Lydia. <laughs> okay, okay. So, the question was, the question was, how do you keep pure, really keep pure in this generation? How do you do that? Well, the first lesson Jesus gives us here is what? It's raise your standards. You've got to raise your standards. Your standards are too low. You're having sex. You're in a physical relationship right now. Your standards are too low. It's not that... God's against the sexuality. It's, it's, he's against the lack of integrity. It's the commitment issue. Okay? It's the commitment issue. God's not against attraction or even sexual exploration, but he's against sexual exploitation. <coughs> What's sexual exploitation? It's dehumanizing another person, taking their dignity and using them and making them a certain object. We talk about the injustice of slavery, which is gone in most countries. What about the injustice, the oldest occupation, the oldest exploitation of our, our planet? It's prostitution and sexual exploitation. And you know, when you get involved in that spirit of your heart and you lust after people, and that's when you join in that spirit. You're joining in the exploitation of humanity of the, and, and the dignity of humanity. And I pray that we as believers can have a healthy sexuality. I want, you to have, I want you to have lots of sex when you're ready for it. I'll do your wedding vows. And, I'll, and you know, rather than you may kiss the bride, I'll go, now you can have sex tonight. <laughs> <laughs> you can do that. And so we don't want to be like the right wing. We live in New York. We're not part of the right wing. or We're not even part of the left wing. But I think there is a way to integrate healthy sexuality, still being holy, amen? And we're going to have to be if we want God's power in our life and God to bless our marriage. Yeah? So another application of this would be this. And I'm just, I, lo I love this stuff. This is fun. Um, is integrity, is if, if your friend is dating someone else, don't covet that girl or that boy. Don't do Dawson, no, don't do Dawson's Creek stuff. <laughs> because that's also sexual exploitation. And some people go, uh, if they don't have a ring, ain't nothing. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. If someone is in a relationship, 
is hands off. Because do you really want to date someone that broke up with someone else for you because you, they thought you were sexy like Brad Pitt and Angela Jones, and you know, and, and you thought, it, it, what, it's not gonna happen again? You, when, you, when you bring someone into your life, you are bringing in that person's integrity. Sex has nothing to do with it. If they can have sex with anyone they want, if they have integrity, they'll just have sex with you. I think that's a good thing. So no one cheats. But what do you think about that? I think that's a good thing. And, and here's the problem with Christians and, and the sexuality of Christians. You know, all of us, because churches don't talk about this, but we will, right? You get educated by the media. And you see TV. And then every single freaking movie today is all sex. Some movie is like just all sex. And I'm like, I, I'm thinking in my mind, and, and some naive people really believe that's what sex is like. So they try to relive that. Let me tell you, you know what? You, you know what? They have, they, it's so uncomfortable to do what they do, okay? It's an illusion, people. Wake up! Okay, wake up, it's not like that! You go, no, I wanna believe that. No, it, it, that's part of the spirit of lust. I wanna believe that's what it is. I wanna believe that's what it is. That's how it's always gonna be. Let me tell you, sex in marriage is only 10% if you're lucky. 90% is all fighting. <laughs> that's, that's when they talk about the makeup sex. Well, you guys are not ready for that. That's way above later. Okay, but now. So what happens here is, how do you keep pure in, your gen in our generation? Is that even possible? Well, you need to raise your standards. Where's the standard? That's what Jesus is going to address next, OK? Let's go down. So first, raise your standards. Everyone here, tell everyone, raise your freaking standards. Say that to everybody. <laughs> Please raise your standards. Now. Okay, just say it once. I think you guys are excited about this issue. But just say it once. Alright? Okay. Now, if your right eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into. Now, now this is a hard thing to swallow. Because it's not the right-wing activist, the, the fundamentalist, that's a little bit crazy, burning Harry Potter books. And I'm like, dude, why did you give me that? <laughs> no, I love Harry Potter. Why are you burning that thing? And it's not the right-wing oppressed sexually. And that's why you have so many gay people coming out of the closet, because they're so repressed. You know, they, they don't talk about sex. That, you know, the thing is bad, all no, it's evil. And that's unhealthy, OK? So it's, this is not coming from the right-wing, OK, fundamentalist. It's coming from the heart of Jesus Christ. And that's why it's a hard thing you, you and I have to swallow here. Why is sexual exploitation, or another word for lust, why does it anger God to the point that God can justify for sending someone to hell or being separated from him forever? Isn't that a hard question? Because, I mean, is, is that, I mean, people want to, you know, minimize the effect of lust in our culture, but why is God so angry enough to separate someone that continues to exploit sexuality to points that God's going to just cut them off from their life? Why does God do that? Why? And we're going to answer the second thing about, but think about it, it's better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And this is the heart issue. I want you to listen to it because really carefully, okay? Because it really is going to hurt all of us. The truth is, when you exploit people sexually, you, what you do is you turn them 
into some, someone that's precious, you turn them to what? An object. You take someone, we sang that song today, right? Beloved, my, my creation, right? I love you as, as you are. You take someone that's human, the beauty part of human, created in God's image, and what you take them, you, 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 what you do is you, Henry, come here. <laughs> and I'm, don't worry, it's giving me nothing bad. Or sexual. <laughs> so, so what happens is, what happens is, the exploitation is you take someone, and this is Henry, right? Hi, Henry. Everybody say hi, Henry. Hi, Henry. What you do? Sexy man, right here. And, and what, what happens? Is, what happens is you, you take them and you and you form them. You know, crush that. You you form them and you slave them and you mold them into what you want them to be and you strip them of everything they are. And you make them an object. And to God, that's unacceptable. You strip everything about them. Okay, thank you. You're right in my hand. My hand. <laughs> I remember I mistakenly got arrested. <laughs> I mean, what do you mean by that? Okay, that means the cops made a mistake, okay? No, no offense to the officer back there. And, um, and they let me go, but I did go to jail in the Bronx out of all places. It's horrible. And, I mean, I'm driving my, I, I don't know what it was, it, I think it was an infinity. And, um, and what happened was, they made a mistake that my license was suspended because they said I didn't, I didn't have insurance, but I did. But it doesn't matter, you're in the Bronx, you're a suspect. And um, especially if you're in that part of the Bronx, they will arrest you without question. So I get arrested right in front of my wife and my mom, out of all people. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they don't, they don't just cuff me. You know, they cuff me really tight, push me to the car, and it really hurts to be cuffed, okay? You guys heard about my other, look how Jiang, I might go to jail, okay? <laughs> you know, and, you know, and but, but I will never forget this day because when I went into the police uh, precinct where they, you know, uh, take your picture, and I was like, ah, you know, wow, cool, you know. And um, one of the comments one officer made, this big dude, he was, he was going off duty, and he said, anybody order any Chinese food? And at that one instant, the whole, that's a victim of racism, right? Bigotry. And everybody, and every freaking officer started to laugh. They just stripped me of everything I was and objectified me and made me to what they wanted me to be. They stripped my degrees, my marriage, my church, my identity, who I was in Christ, and made me something to laugh about, a mockery. And that's when I thought, I, I, I couldn't say, it. I was like, I didn't know it was like this. Still. And it hurt me. And it also pissed me off. But that's exactly what happens when you exploit people, either sexually or racially. That's what you do. You strip everything about them and you turn them into what you want. That's unbelievable. Sinful. And that's what you do every single time you look at someone less. That's what happens every single time you compromise your integrity of your sexuality. You turn people that are created in God's image into the image you want. And you exploit them. And that's why God is upset and is willing to separate people from him if they keep on doing this. I believe sexual exploitation is one of the worst kinds of injustice in the world. But you know what? Our city loves it. And Christians continue to do it. Today, God is giving us an alternative. Amen?
And it's a heart issue, okay, for a lot of us. But today's the day. Make a vow like Job to never look at anyone lustfully again. Amen? And keep your eyes pure. Because Matthew 5 again says that only the pure will see God. Well, how would God reveal himself to people that exploit the people he loves? He will never do that. That's why only the pure in heart will see God. If you want to see God, you want to see power in your life, you need to make this vow of cutting lust out of your life permanently. So the question was, is it even possible? How do you keep yourself pure in this generation? Well, the second lesson Matthew here gives us is what? Respect the sanctity of people's dignity. What is the word sanctity mean? The sanctity is the sacredness of something unadulterated as it is. People have names, family, gifts, talents. They are made in the image of God, beautiful as they are. Don't adulterate it by objectifying people. That's the spirit of lust. That's what we give into when we lust. And a lot of people don't see it because all you see is what you want and what you need, but what you're doing is really exploiting people. And God's against any type of injustice, and that's one of them. And I pray today that Everyone here will respect the sanctity of people's dignity. Amen? Because that's what we need to do. I mean, seriously, it's time that the church have men and women that can have actual relationship with men and female without the sexuality aspect of it. Fathers, daughters, sisters, brothers. That's what the family of God's supposed to be. But the church is so bounded by lust that there is this, this great divide still exists between men and women in the church. Can you imagine a body where you have other brothers and sisters and mothers and aunts? And, I don't know. And you all really love each other instead of exploiting each other. I mean, some people just go to church to, to find their other significant other. And I think that's not such a bad idea. But the truth is, and I, I want to be really honest and real serious, the people you lust after are people you know, not entertainers on TV. The people you lust after are people you know that have names, that's part of your relationship, but you objectify them anyway. And that's the sin God wants to get rid of in your life, in, in, in our lives. And that's why it's so real. People are like, man, last week was heavy, now this is heavier. You know what? When we started this church, we said that we're not going to say nice things to people. <laughs> we're going to be honest with people. We're going to be honest with you. Because I believe God really is calling us to be a generation that's pure before God, that has, that's walks in sexual integrity, and, but, but also maintains a healthy sexuality. Not we're like afraid of it, oh, I can't talk about sex. You know, <laughs> shut up, come on, this is 2008. So, who are the people in your life you're not respecting? Stop it. Respect them. Respect the sanctity of their dignity. Give them back who they are. I pray that the Holy Spirit would convict you today to cut this off in your life. Now, grace. How many people like the grace part? <laughs> the two points usually are the hard part. But there is the grace part, the practical part of how do I get out of this thing? Okay, you know, I need to raise my standards. Okay, I need to respect people. Now, okay, how do I really do this? Well, okay, sit down. And this is where Jesus, in his practical great wisdom, answers it, right? And if you read this and you're like, what? Okay. Uh, if, if you're right, I causes you to sin, gouge it out, and... 
Or if your right hand causes you sin, cut it off, right? It's better for you to go to, uh, go to heaven with one arm than go to hell with, you know, with whatever. I forgot what it said. <laughs> <laughs> This is something in English we call what? It's a form of exaggeration. Jesus is exaggerating. Please don't cut out. If someone really does this, really, <laughs> call me in the first 30 seconds, because we could sew your hand back together. But after that, you know, we don't know. No, don't do that. But Jesus is using an hyperbole to, to emphasize the severity of how you need to fight the spirit of lust in your life. The extremity is the emphasis is how you need to fight with such tenacity that you're willing to cut your hand off. That you will, what basically means you're willing to do anything to get this out of your life. Because if you continue to do it, God does have sanctioned just, you know, righteously to separate you from Him. He's saying fight and do whatever it takes to get, rid, to get you know, rid of this in your life. For me, I made a vow in ninth grade to never, ever look at a woman lustfully again. And I never have. Still today, I never have. Okay? <laughs> my wife likes that. And I told my dad, Dad, we need to get rid of HBO. My dad said, why? I love HBO. <laughs> I like to watch movies, you know? And I said, no, no, we need to, but why? I go, we just need to get rid of HBO. It's <laughs> some bad material on it. And my dad said, okay, fine, we'll cancel it. And I'm like, thank God, because there's some bad stuff on HBO, especially for a kid at that age. And I got rid of HBO. And, 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 and then what happened was it, it, you, you become sort of like a prude. You become foolish to the world. You look retarded. Because everybody at that is looking at Playboy and this and this and this and that, and you, you're trying to, you're like, no, no, you're going away from it. And you're, not, you're walking into a train station, and there's a very beautiful woman, and, you're, you're, and your friends are like, oh my god, and you're going to the next, you know, you're going to the next one, where there's an old lady. <laughs> and, and you begin to do this, and you know what, one of the greatest... <laughs> But let me just tell you, one of the greatest things that happened in my life when I made a vow to no longer look at objectify women was the revelation of God. You begin to see God in ways you never ever before because you're not always repenting. <laughs> and you begin to, to get a, to grow a hunger for God, and you begin you begin to have the father heart of God. It's to protect humanity, it's protect women and men and children, and, and you begin to, to become like, and you know what, it's really, Matthew 5 is true, when only the pure will, of heart will see God. And it's brought such power and in, in revelation into my life that it totally changed my life, and I would never, ever want to become that man that's like 50 or 30, that's just looking at women, exploiting them. And think, hey, what's wrong with that? I'm not hurting anybody. Is that the type of person you want to be? Don't you want to be like the Father God? That really can love people well. Because let me just tell you something right now. You're never going to be able to love the opposite gender properly until you get this thing out of your life. That's going to be our very foundation of breaking the zero barrier. It's not enough for us to struggle with it, we need to overcome it. So we can love the opposite gender because you're never gonna be able to love them long as this is part of your life. Because it's going to mess up your lenses, the way you see people. We must get rid of this out of our lives if we want to see God and if we want to love people. So, how do you keep yourself pure in this generation, this adulterated, sinful generation. Last lesson is what? <laughs> Run like hell. Because the Bible says, right? Flee from lust. 
Don't slowly walk away from it. Flee from lust. That's what Joseph did. That woman was like, Joseph! And Joseph said, oh, no, no. And he ran off. He ran off with his shirt off. He ran off. Why? Because he wanted to be holy before God. He made a commitment to God. And he wanted to see God. A lot of us need to begin to really, in the places in our lives, we need to run like hell. Or you're never going to get rid of it in your life. You're never going to get out of it in your life. You're just going to always be someone objectifying, exploiting, or being the one exploited. You're always going to be bonded by this, and you're never going to really be able to see God or even love the opposite gender, even if you want to. I mean, people have to go in, in, in counseling for years to get rid of some abuses in their life sexually and still trying to recover from it because of the abuses of, of sexual exploitation. Why would we want to be part of that as people, men and women of the Father, sons and daughters of God? Why would we want to do that? And the question really is, Jesus leaves us with in this passage, is do you really want to be like me? That's the Beatitudes. That's the heart of the Beatitudes. Do you really want to be like me? And the question I want to ask you is, do you really want to be like Jesus? Or are you just playing games? You want to get away with stuff. You want to take advantage of God, take advantage of people, but look like you're good, look like you're holy. Or do you really want to be like him inside and out? That's the question God's asking you. Do you want to be like me? Will you answer that today? Stand and pray together.